Welcome back. Federal health officials on Friday ended their pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine while adding a warning label about a very rare but troubling blood clotting disorder. While this is good news in the effort to vaccinate as many Americans as possible, there are still concerns that vaccine hesitancy could grow as a result of the J&J episode, creating another hurdle in our fight against the virus. So joining me now is the director of the National Institutes of Health. It's Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins, welcome back to Meet the Press, sir. Nice to be with you, Chuck. Let me start with the news about the J&J vaccine. You and I talked before this decision. It is out. Um, the warning label seems to be more general than specific, and some doctors have wondered why it wasn't more specific. Here's Dr. Lena Wen in the Post. She says, the default position should be against administering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to women under 50, period. Um, what do you say to her? Well, I think she's in the minority compared to the decision that was put forward by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices of CDC, which met for an entire day on Friday and went over all of the data, uh, documenting a total of some 13 cases of this rare form of blood clotting out of some 8 million doses of the J&J &J vaccine that had been administered. And the strong conclusion of that group was that the vaccine should go forward. It should be made available to everybody. But there should be a fact sheet that provides the information to everybody to understand what the nature is of this potential very rare side effect so that everyone is aware of the facts. And I think that was the right decision. I do think people will want to read the fact sheet. But right. when you consider the, the nature of this risk, this is truly a rare event. And when you measure that against the benefits of preventing somebody from dying of COVID, there's no comparison. We clearly have a situation where the benefits greatly outweigh the risks, even for younger women. All these statistics I've read seems to reinforce that point you just said about how rare it is for this to happen. Can you give us, give viewers a layman's comparison here? What is a common drug that, that, that is out there that people take where it would be, you would almost have a, 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 be at higher risk of this than you would with this J&J &J vaccine? Well, think about aspirin. All of us have been taking aspirin for headaches and muscle aches for the last many decades. Uh, the risk of aspirin inducing a significant intestinal bleed is much higher than what we're talking about here. Something in the neighborhood of one in 500, one in 1,000 for people who regularly take uh, aspirin. We're talking about something here that's about a thousand times less likely to happen. But we Americans, we're not that good at this kind of risk calculation. Something sounds scary. Somebody has pointed out you are less likely as a woman taking J&J &J to have this blood clotting problem than to get struck by lightning next year. So it's a really low risk. And we do figure out how to do that. We wear our seat belts, right? Uh, what are you doing there? You're trying to prevent a bad outcome if you're in a car crash. Back when seatbelts were first being introduced, people were like, well, you know, suppose my car goes into a lake and I can't get unbuckled quickly enough right. and I drown. Well, OK, I guess that's in there, too. Yeah. <laughs> but balancing the benefits and the risks, which is what we're trying to do here, yeah. you come out pretty clearly on the side of roll up your sleeve. All right. Let's talk about the issue of vaccine hesitancy. You and I, again, we were talking about this earlier. You've been doing your best to reach out to communities of faith in particular. Um, but as you noted to me, and as our poll will show you, I'm going to put the numbers up here. Uh, we have a political divide. Uh, among Democrats, 75% of all Democrats are, call themselves already vaccinated, and only 4% of Democrats say they will not get vaccinated. The numbers among Republicans, 40% already vaccinated. Uh, one quarter of Republicans saying they will not get vaccinated. Look, this is not easy for a Democratic administration led administration to try to convince um, these Republicans to do this. What are some of the efforts you guys need, um, are thinking about that might sort of depoliticize this? Well, it is a really important issue because we're all in this together. And clearly, if we're going to be able to put COVID-19 behind us, uh, we need to have all Americans take part in getting us to that point. I think maybe one of the things we can do is to change the conversation a little bit. I think maybe there's been too much finger wagging. I've done some of that. I'm going to try to stop mm -hmm. and listen, in, in fact, to what people's specific questions are. And also, Chuck, try to emphasize the positives that people experience who go through vaccination, as I have and as my wife has. 
we were able to invite another couple to come to our house for dinner and take off our masks because they were immunized as well and have a normal conversation and hug each other at the end of the evening. That was so liberating. If you're not vaccinated, you're missing out on that chance to lift that mm -hmm. sort of blanket of fear that's been there. Even, even if you don't think COVID-19 is that big a deal, tell me whether you haven't at some points worried about whether that's gonna hit you and your family. This is the way to put that fear behind us and to get back to normal life. That's an incredible gift and you just have to unwrap the gift. Uh, I know all of you public health officials are, are, are resisting all of our questions when we say, what is, when do we get to herd immunity? Right. I understand it's a moving target. It's a bit uh -huh. subjective due to variants and things like this. But how risky or how much risk do we have of not hitting herd immunity if we continue to have these vaccine hesitancy rates? Well, we have a serious risk. And the reason nobody will give you an answer, Chuck, is because we don't really quite know with this particular virus, with the variants that are happening, exactly what that number is. But it's up there around 70, 85 percent. And we're not there yet. You can see some places in the country that are getting close to that uh, with a combination of having had a lot of cases of COVID, which mm -hmm. also provides you with some immunity plus the vaccines. But there are other places that are way behind. And those are the places we all worry about as the next hotspot. You can see Michigan has gone through a terrible time in the last month. They are now getting past that, which is really encouraging. But what's the next one? You can look at the map and say, where are vaccines lagging? Mm -hmm. Those are the places to worry about. And we could change that if we can really inspire everybody to get engaged. And we're doing everything we can to make it easy to get vaccination. 90% uh, of the, of the uh, right. country now lives within five miles of a site where you can get uh, vaccination done. It's out there in the pharmacies. Doctors are getting more engaged. It's not that difficult as it was at the beginning uh, to get yourself an appointment and to get into this right. immunized group, which is where I think most people really want to be. We saw some announcements this week of a couple of university systems that are going to mandate the vaccine in order to come on campus, in order to teach things like this. And we know that there are other entities that would like to have vaccine mandates, but you can't have a mandate under emergency use authorization for these vaccines. Um, what is the timetable, at least particularly with Moderna and Pfizer uh, here generally, when we should expect uh, this to go from emergency use to uh, formal approval? That is not a timetable that's been precisely defined just yet. Uh, again, to get the permanent approval, you need a certain number of months of follow-up to look at any possible late safety signals. There have not been any for Pfizer and Moderna, but FDA is not quite there yet. I think that's a question for FDA about when will they say this is enough. They need some other data also. It's kind of nitty-gritty technical stuff about manufacturing, and yeah. that information has to be provided. But we're not there. We will get there in the next few months. Meantime, I think if private organizations decide they want to put forward a mandate, um, I'm not going to disagree with their approach. After all, vaccines are good for you. I'm certainly encouraging everybody who works for me at the National Institutes of Health to get vaccinated, but I'm not mandating it. Think about it, though, in the future, though, uh, for particularly yeah. for people who are in health care and have interactions with vulnerable patients. Yep. We have been able to go in the direction of saying you should get your flu shot. I suspect uh, the same will need to be the case for COVID once we're at the point where we no longer have this block about it being emergency use. So people who are involved in health care, yep. I expect that's where we're going. Dr. Francis Collins, always appreciate um, having you on and your expertise, the director of the NIH. And for those that are wondering, technically, Dr. Fauci's boss. Anyway, Dr. Collins, thanks for coming on and sharing your views with us. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Chuck. It's always a pleasure. You got Good it. morning to everybody. You got it. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.